Rome four times uh, between November 2016 and June 2018. What you did not mention is that I am an Irish citizen. Uh, I have dual nationality, so I'm oh. happy to be home. <laughs> uh, we are, um, we're thinking today about women deacons and synodality, uh, how and why will and should the restoration of women to the ordained diaconate be a topic for synodal discussion? And will the discussion make any difference at all? Let me say at the, re at the, uh, at the outset here, my research and my writing does not approach priesthood, which, comprom which com comprises a completely different discussion from the question of restoring women as deacons. As far as the, the discussion about women as deacons, the church has no doctrinal finding, no official statement, no history that eliminates women from the ordained office of deacon. So how does this affect at least the two, first two aims of your group? Uh, one, equality of all the baptized, where decision-making is actively shared by all with appropriate structures for this. And two, uh, full participation of women in all aspects of church life, including priesthood. <clears throat> To start with the second, I agree that women should have full participation, should be full participants in all aspects of church life. But again, I do not argue for priesthood. It just has not been my work. As for the first, the inclusion of the baptized in decision making is extremely important. But let, let's distinguish management and ministry in our synodal thinking today. Management. On March 19, 2022, Pope Francis issued a new apostolic constitution for the Roman Curia, the offices that help him govern the Catholic Church. Predicate Evangelum, Preach the Gospel, has been in the works since the beginning of Pope Francis's pontificate, actually nine years ago. It becomes effective June 5th, replacing the charter Pastor Bonus, the Good Shepherd, which was promulgated by John Paul II in 1988. The completion of this constitution demonstrates Pope Francis's hope, I think, to make the church, or at least the church bureaucracy, more inclusive. Now, the new constitution deals with the management of the church, the management of the curia. Toward the end of the 16th century, in 1588, the first organization of the curia occurred. Now, the purpose was to gather the cardinals in Rome, the cardinal deacons, the cardinal priests, the cardinal bishops, into one organization to manage church affairs. They were divided into different departments to manage different responsibilities. For example, there was a Department of State for relations with other countries. There was the Congregation of the Inquisition, which later became the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And there were congregations for other matters, for forbidden books, for public welfare, for roads, bridges, and waters, even a congregation for the Navy. At the time, the head of every office was a cardinal. However, historically, men who were not deacons, priests, or bishops could be cardinals. Many, if all, if not all, of the so-called lay cardinals of history were at least tonsured and thereby were members of the clerical state. Anyway, as things evolved, by the 20th century, one had to be a priest to be named a cardinal. And since the promulgation of the 1983 Code of Canon Law, Anyone named a cardinal is asked to accept Episcopal consecration. Now, with the new apostolic constitution reorganizing the curia, all the offices, including those that used to be called congregations or councils or commissions, are now to be called dicasteries. And the heads of these offices can now be any member of the faithful, a bishop, priest, deacon, Yes, but also a married wo ma woman, a married man, a single lay person, non-ordained religious, or a cardinal could be appointed. The important point is that Pope Francis has made it clear that he wants the most competent people running these offices. Now, one interesting point is that Pope Francis says that when choosing clerics, must be, they must be chosen equally from both the Latin churches and the Eastern churches, as well as from among religious. So for example, one office could not be staffed completely by priests uh, from one religious order. It's all management. Is it important? Of course it is. 
Both Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI have said that women need to be given more space in the church. The expression they used in Italian, più spazio, is the expression you might use if you were sitting at a table with others and your friend came along and you said, you know, move over, make, make some more room here. Now, does that mean expanding the number of people in the management structure? Not necessarily. What I think it means is move over, let the women have a place. <clears throat> now, Francis's new apostolic constitution does not constitute a departure from church teaching. It is, however, a departure from tradition with a small t, because until now, the Curia has been staffed mainly by priests, bishops, cardinals, and religious, including women religious, with a few secular lay persons. But the prefects, or the heads of every curial office, have nearly always been cardinals. Over the past 20 or 30 years, women religious and other lay women have been working as officials or officers. But so it's not really new to have lay people in the curia. What is new is the possibility of having lay people in positions of real authority as heads of offices. Now, the dicastery for communication is already headed by a married layman, Paolo Ruffini, and there surely be other lay dicastery heads named in the weeks and months ahead. Now, the actual members of the dicastery are usually all cardinals, but they're not the people who do the work. The members, until recently, as I said, mostly cardinals or other clerics, they come in for meetings once or twice a year. The people doing the work are the staff. And there are many, many competent women already working in the Vatican, but many only serve as scribes or technical assistants. Many women who work as secretaries in the Korea have PhDs and speak several languages, but they're not the heads of offices. So, as I said, having lay people work in management is not really a departure from tradition so much as it is an expansion of tradition. The Apostolic Constitution is the highest level document a pope can live, levy. In, however, he's not changing doctrine. In other words, this document is not really a departure. It is grounded in tradition and rooted in the past. Pope Francis wants to get everyone who's competent at the table, but this is unrelated to the question of ordaining women. However, what is interesting is the history of the so-called lay cardinals. The last non-ordained cardinal, Teodolfo Mertel, died in 1899. He was named a cardinal two months before they made him a deacon, but he never became a priest. And I get this question all the time. Can a woman be a cardinal? I think yes. You know, I think you can have a lay cardinal, but it would require a dispensation from the law, you know, a kind of a waiver. To me, it would be easier to have a woman deacon cardinal because there are still formal ranks of cardinals, of cardinals, cardinal deacon, cardinal priest, and cardinal bishop. But what about ministry? See, I think the apostolic constitution, this new apostolic constitution continues the discussion, but again, we have to distinguish management from ministry, not that the management is not a ministry, but I mean sacramental ministry here. Pope Francis sees his new apostolic constitution as part of the ministry of spreading the gospel. Well, I think if he wants to spread the gospel, he needs to ordain women to preach the gospel. And if he wants to argue that women are made in the image and likeness of God, he needs to have a woman deacon standing next to him proclaiming the gospel at St. Peter's Basilica. Because large portions of the world, unfortunately, hold the idea that women are chattel. That's okay, for example, for women to suffer female genital mutilation. That it's okay for men to simply disregard women. We have too many examples of disrespect for women's rights in society. Too many women and girls are damaged. As for the diaconate, we cannot forget the history. Men deacons and women deacons existed as members of the one diaconate, not as part of the priesthood until the 12th century. And we have evidence of ordained women deacons up until the 12th century in Lucca in Northern Italy. In the early church, deacons managed the church's charity. We cannot say that all deacons, male and female, performed all diaconal church tasks in all territories in all eras. But what is known from the ancient church is illustrative. You brought your gifts to the celebration. The gifts of bread and wine were brought to the altar by the deacon. 
then at the end, if you needed an egg or a blanket or a chicken, you got it from the deacon. The last person in line to get paid was the priest. But eventually the diaconate as it existed was quashed and the priest took over the treasury and the diaconate became highly ceremonial. Soon no one was ordained a deacon unless he, and only he, was eligible to become a priest. I will say that there is evidence that women were ordained as deacons, the so-called permanent deacons, during some period after what's called the cursus on norm took hold. See, the minor orders, porter, lector, exorcist, and acolyte, were part of the cursus honorum, the course of honor, which led to the subdiaconate, the diaconate, and the priesthood, in which only men participated. And you may know, in 1972, Pope Paul VI collapsed the minor orders and the major order of subdeacon into two, lector and acolyte. Recently, Pope Francis legislated that women may be installed as lectors and acolytes. He, he modified Canon uh, 230, paragraph one, to say, laity who possess the age and qualifications established by degree, decree of the Conference of Bishops can be admitted on a stable basis through the prescribed liturgical rite to the ministries of lector and acolyte. Now, since you must be installed as lector or acolyte before being ordained as deacon, he has eliminated one step that keeps women from the diaconate. And as you know, he's also inst created a new instituted lay ministry, that of catechists. I think what we need to recognize is that Pope Francis is trying to show the church that everybody matters and that we all have distinct abilities. The various ministries that essentially collapsed into seminary formation as the seminaries of the Council of Trent called for uh, became the primary, then really the only means of training priests, are now being recreated as distinct ministries for which all are eligible. And my position is that we need more ministry, that more ministry would encourage more priestly vocations. And the important point here is that we need more ministers. Pope Benedict XVI in his 2009 Motu Proprio, titled Omnium in Mentum, to everyone's attention, clearly distinguish between the priesthood and the diaconate. And please recall, there has never been any Vatican statement against ordaining women as deacons. In 1997, a subcommittee of the International Theological Commission completed a document indicating that the church can ordain women deacons. But then, but the then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who was at the time the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, refused to sign it, and that document was not published. Two members of that subcommittee have told me this. Cardinal Ratzinger then created a completely new subcommittee, again all male, which produced a document which it is important to note is not a magisterial document, it is not binding, and it does not represent church teaching. It represents the opinion of a few scholars as follows. And I'll read to you the conclusion. With regard to the ordination of women to the diaconate, it should be noted that two important indications emerge from what has been set up to this point. The deaconesses mentioned in the tradition of the ancient church as evidenced by the right of institution and the functions they exercise were not purely and simply equivalent to the deacons. Second, the unity of the sacrament of holy orders in the clear distinction between the ministries of the bishop and the priests on the one hand, and the diaconal ministry on the other is strongly underlined, underlined by ecclesial tradition, especially in the teaching of the magisterium. So finally, in light of these elements, which have been set out to the present historical theo theological research document, it pertains to the ministry of discernment, which the Lord established in his church to pronounce authoritatively on this question. <clears throat> I won't go into too much detail here, but I must point out that the few pages in the second 2002 report on women deacons present insufficient research and that 18 sentences or passages within that report were taken from previously published writing of Gerhard L. Mueller, who was named Bishop of Regensburg almost immediately upon the document's publication, which was first actually only in French, 
and who was appointed prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith by Pope Benedict XVI in 2012. He is a personal friend of Benedict and the editor of the Opera Omnia, the collection of Benedict's writings. In any event, the findings of this subcommittee are what they are. The important statement they made is that the question of women deacons is something the magisterium had to decide. Well, the magisterium at the time was controlled by Pope John Paul II, who did nothing. The next Pope was Benedict XVI, the former Cardinal Ratzinger, who did nothing. And it was not until 2016 when the Sisters of the International Union of Superiors General, the UISG, asked about women religious who already were doing the work of deacons, could they be ordained to that office? And Pope Francis agreed to establish a commission. I was nominated by the UASG. As I said, I spent two years on the commission. We produced a document and Pope Francis gave a portion of it to the UISG leadership in May of 2019. He said he had other papers and would give them to them if they asked. That following winter, the president of the UISG told media they had received the history portion of our document. I do not know if the UISG has received any other documents. Then, on April 8th, 2020, Pope Francis named a new commission, but it did not meet until early September 2021 for one week. <clears throat> its February 2022 meeting was canceled shortly after it became known that one of its members, Caroline Ferry, had signed an anti-Pope Francis anti-vaccination manifesto called the Bethlehem Declaration, published by the Canadian website LifeSite News. There is no public information about any future meetings. So, where are we now? I think the new apostolic constitution is a good thing. And I think the Synod on Synodality is a good thing. I participated in several online synod meetings with the Carmelites in Baltimore, Maryland, with the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary in New York, among others. But I was not invited to what the people in my own parish are calling the, quote, secret synod meeting, to which the pastor invited about 20 or 30 persons who for one hour were permitted to stand and speak to the entire group. All is not lost, however, since around the world, various lay organizations are holding two-part synodal discussions according to the Vatican's Vatimecum. I can point in the United States, the Voice of the Faithful, to discerning deacons and a few others. And I can assure you that they will be sending their findings far and wide. I'm sure you know about the final paragraph in the Vatimecum, but let me read it to you. Each diocese can choose to prepare the synthesis either before or after the diocesan pre-synodal meeting, as long as the fruits of that meeting are also incorporated into the diocesan synthesis. As much as possible, everyone should feel that his or her voice has been represented in the synthesis. As a model of transparency, the members of the drafting team, as well as the process of synthesizing the feedback be made public once it has been drafted as a touchstone for the journey of the diocese along the path of synodality. As much as possible, opportunities can be given to the people of God to review and respond to the content of the diocesan synthesis before it is officially sent to the Episcopal Conference. So, you know what you want to say about women and about women deacons in your own synodal report. I can tell you that I was told by an official of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith sitting at lunch in the Doma Sancte Marta one day that women could not be ordained deacons because women cannot image Christ. Therefore, the title of one of my books is Women Icons of Christ. You know, nobody argues about the historical fact of women deacons. They existed in the early church. And I think the world cries for the restoration of women to the diaconate. The church must argue, that's you, that's me. The church must argue and argue forcefully that women can be icons of Christ. But that's up to you, guided by the spirit to make known. Thank you.